The following you are about to hear may seem strange and bizarre, but it is our intention to bring you only documented proof. The general public is unaware of the fact that for the past 200 years, fires of revolution have been smoldering beneath the whole structure of civilization. In 1953, the California Senate Investigating Committee on Education released its 11th annual report. On pages 169 and 170 of that document, we find the following words, quote, so-called modern communism is apparently the same hypocritical and deadly world conspiracy to destroy civilization that was founded by the secret order of the Illuminati in Bavaria on May 1st, 1776. The recognition of May 1st, 1776 as the founding date of this world revolution conspiracy is not hard to understand when it is realized that May Day is frequently celebrated even in recent times by rioting and bloodshed on a worldwide scale. It was not until 1847 or 48 that the communist conspirators who had theretofore operated in secret came out into the open with the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, boldly proclaiming against practically everything upon which civilization is based, God, religion, the family, individual liberty, and so forth. The concluding paragraph on the manifesto reading, Communists scorn to hide their views and aims. They openly declare that their purpose can only be achieved by forcible overthrow of the whole existing social order. Let the ruling classes tremble at the prospect of a communist revolution. Proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Proletarians of all lands unite. In issuing this manifesto, the communist conspirators evidently believed that time had arrived when, with the aid of ignorant victims, a worldwide takeover could be accomplished. But there were not enough ignorant victims to manipulate them, and the expectant coup failed. The conspirators thereupon conceived a plan for the future of supplementing the long-established secret conspiracy in existence since 1776 with an unremitting public campaign for victims among the ignorant of all nations. And in an attempt to hide from view the underlying hypocritical conspiracy existing since May 1st, 1776, it was decided that in such public campaign, the Manifesto of 1848 should be heralded as the founding date of communism, and Karl Marx falsely proclaimed as its author. So wrote the elected members of this California State Senate Committee in 1953. Here and there, lone voices have been raised to alert the world to the imminent dangers from this satanic conspiracy of the forces of darkness. Their voices have largely gone unheeded, and even many leaders of the so-called anti-communist movement have failed to grasp the staggering realities of this conspiracy within the conspiracy. One who saw the total picture was Commander William Guy Carr. This recording was taken from a speech delivered by Commander Carr in Chicago in 1958, a few months before his death. It was not Carr's intention to document the whole history of the Illuminati conspiracy in this speech, since a great many books had already been printed on the Illuminati, the World Revolutionary Movement, including his own books, Pawns in the Game and Red Fog Over America. In this speech, Commander Carr sets forth the basic philosophical concepts behind the greatest mystery of all time, the revolutionary attempts to overthrow all governments and all religions in order to enslave the whole human race under a super one-world government ruled by satanic despotism. 
as an official lecturer for the Royal Canadian Navy, Commander Carr constantly warned large audiences in the 30s about the world conspiracy and the forthcoming Second World War. During that time, he wrote seven best-selling novels. Some were selected to become part of the Royal Library, the Library of War Museum, and the Sir Millington Drake Library at Eton College, and the Braille Library for the Blind. Carr's most widely read book, Pawns in the Game, is considered by most historical experts of the Illuminati as the most comprehensively documented book ever published on the Illuminati. The sound on this recording is primitive due to the fact that it was placed on tape in a large meeting hall. However, despite the sound quality and other technical shortcomings, the facts contained in this speech are of such significance that it is reproduced exactly as it was given. Carr's speech will be interrupted occasionally by this narrator who will insert salient comments on what Carr has said in order to highlight certain particularly significant parts of his message. This recording is not meant to entertain the listener. It is an historical recording of great importance about a conspiracy that has lasted for thousands of years. Numerous books have been written on the subject of the Illuminati, and it has been referred to by such men as George Washington, John Adams, and Abraham Lincoln. A list of books for the listener who wishes to pursue this subject will be found on the liner notes on the back of this record. I would like to present to you a figure that has given much of his life for the welfare of humanity and to study the things that are going on in the world revolutionary movement. Our speaker this evening has a very wonderful way of presenting a message that is so badly needed, and I hope that each of you will listen uh, with open minds and forget all prejudices and all bigotry. We have nothing to gain by hatred, and our speaker will certainly give us the reasons for that. And so at this time, we're very happy and proud to present the Commander William Guy Carr from Canada. Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the inspiring words of the song that you have just sung, Parallel Hours in Canada, we sing, O Canada, as God save our Queen, but all citizens of countries that we still speak of as being free are in the same boat. Unless we be doers of the word as well as hearers, unless we translate what we say into action, I'm afraid we are going to suffer the penalty of our indifference. We have the words of the Our Father, everybody praises. Many times a day, in some cases, we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But what do we actually do towards establishing God's plan for the rule of creation and putting it into effect on this earth? If we had, during the last 2,000 years, put those words into effect, the Luciferian conspiracy could not have developed to where it is today in its semi-final stage. Adam Weishoff, who is a doctor of canon law in Eagle Stat University, revised and modernized the age-old conspiracy and then reorganized the Illuminati and organized the Grand Orient Lodges to be their secret hiding place. These brilliant-minded men consisted of men of all walks of life, scientists, military leaders, 
economists, educationalists, encyclopedias, and so on. That is where the word Illuminati is derived from. They are undoubtedly brilliant-minded men. And unfortunately, they have become self-conceited, so swell-headed, that they actually believe that they know better than Almighty God how the universe should be ruled, and that is the struggle that's going on today. But if we start to finish revising the age-old conspiracy and modernizing it, on May 1st, 1776, he said that communism, Jacobinism, Nazism, world federalism, political Zionism, and any and all other organizations that had internationalism or one world government as their ultimate aim were to be organized, financed, directed, and controlled by the members of the Illuminati. The Illuminati, down through the ages of time, have always made provision to elect and select those who are to succeed them from their own immediate entourage. They are children of well-bred families whom, because of the fact that they show exceptional mental achievement, are highly educated and thoroughly trained to serve the purpose of those that direct the world revolutionary movement. These youngsters, when they are going through college and university, don't realize why they are being showered with grants and scholarships and all the rest. They become strongly attached for those that finance their education and then place them into exceptional the remunerated positions. And it is useless to deny the fact that after these brilliant-minded young men have been educated under the tuition of men that represent themselves as one world, that they are fully qualified to act as specialists, experts, and advisors behind the scenes of our government. Thus it is through these men whom we term agentur, that the governments of your country and mine, since way back in history, have been made or advised or pressured into accepting policies that have always ended in reoccurring wars and revolutions. Because the principle on which the Luciferian conspiracy is based is the ability to keep secret their plans and for the Illuminati and their agent tour to keep dividing the world's population into opposing camps in ever-increasing numbers so that they can be armed and after they are armed they are built up to more or less equal in strength, we call that in military terms, balance of power, and after that has been done, the Illuminati invariably produce the incident which will cause the opposing sides to fight and destroy each other, while those that foment the uh, wars and revolutions reap the financial benefits and sit back on the sidelines patiently waiting for the day when all governments and religions will have been destroyed as world powers. Westhoff said that when this point is reached, then, for the first time, they will make known to the masses 
the pure light of the true doctrine of Lucifer and impose it with satanic despotism. What Weishaupt said in the 1700s, the latter part of the 1700s, Pike, General Albert Pike, confirmed in the latter part of the 1800s. Pike, with the aid of Giuseppe Mazzini, worked out the military blueprint which would cause the world to be involved in wars and revolutions until, to use his own words, only two world powers remained and those two were to be the people controlled by the leaders of atheistic communism and those that subscribed to the Christian religion. I know it is very hard for the average, decent, clean-minded citizen to realize that such a devilish, and I use the word advisedly, diabolical plot has been in operation. But the scriptures the Old Testament is nothing more or less than the history of that conspiracy of the Luciferian forces to prevent the human race establishing God's plan for the rule of creation, putting it in effect on this earth. Christ himself came to show us what must be done if we were going to halt that conspiracy on this earth as St. Michael halted it in heaven. He told us who were directing that experience. He said, it is they of the synagogue of Satan. He said, they are sons of the devil, Lucifer, whose lust they will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He knows not the truth, for the truth is not in him. When asked, who are these men? He said, them that call themselves Jews, but are not and do lie. The devil's whole plan is to use cunning and deceit. That is why our Heavenly Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, told us that he was the father of lies. And they will make any statement and justify the telling of a deliberate lie, providing it moves their conspiracy towards its final goal. Mazzini, Giuseppe Mazzini was an Italian. And if you look in your encyclopedias, you will find him eulogized as a great Italian patriot. That is how the Asians who direct this conspiracy deceive the people into believing what is a direct lie. Giuseppe Mazzini was the director of the World Revolutionary Movement and Karen was appointed as the director of the whole World Revolutionary Movement in 1834. After the French Revolution had, was over and the American situation here was in turmoil, Mazzini came to America. And he consulted with General Albert Pike, who was disgruntled because his Indian auxiliary troops had been disbanded on the charge that they had committed atrocities under the cloak of legitimate warfare. Therefore, Pike became an alum, and he built a house in Little Rock with 13 rooms in 1840. And it was in that house where he worked to perfect the military blueprint of wars and revolutions that would bring Weishaupt's plan to its final stage. The blueprint called, first of all, for the putting into effect of Weishaupt's plan 
to create international atheistic commons and then use it as the Illuminati's destructive force to help them destroy all existing governments and religions. I know it hurts when the truth of history reveals that men who have been built up by false propaganda, international heroes, are proved to be Peter Clay. But what is true of some of your statesmen and politicians in the past is equally true of ours in Canada and those of Britain. Since the turn of the 19th century, since 1801, there has hardly been a prime minister in England or Canada or a president in this United States with the exception of Lincoln who wasn't under the control of the Illuminati. I explained briefly this afternoon how Weishaupt's plan was made known by an act of God. The German author Zwack, Z-W-A-C-K, had laboriously put these revised protocols together and so that they would be safe and to guard against all being destroyed at one time, the copies of this document were placed in different parts of the world. I explained that Professor John Robinson, Professor of Human Psychology of Edinburgh University and Secretary of the Royal Society, when touring Germany, and visiting the University of Frankfurt and Ingolstadt had been asked to guard a copy of the secret document. He was not informed as to their nature, but he did place them in safekeeping. And after the plot had been revealed by the act of God and the Bavarian government had published the horrible details of this international plot, Professor Robert Robinson unlocked this strong box in which he had kept them and found that the documents he had confirmed everything that the Bavarian government had published in 1786. I told you that while West Off's courier was riding on horseback from Frankfurt to Paris, with a copy of this precious document, in famous document, for the information of those Illuminists and Jacobins who had been entrusted with developing the French Revolution, which was scheduled to break out in 1789, Almighty God struck him dead as he rode through the village of Rathesborn. The courier was struck by lightning. And the Bavarian police found this document on the courier's body. Realizing its importance, the serious nature of it, they turned it over to the Bavarian government, who in turn had the police raid all West Coast Grand Orient lodges and the homes of those who were known to be connected with him in the order and sex of the Illuminati. The evidence thus obtained confirmed the document as being genuine and it was published in 1786 under the title The Original Writings of the Order and Sect of the Illuminati. Copies of this document were sent to the heads of church and state throughout Europe. But such was the power of those experts, specialists and advisors who had been infiltrated behind the scenes of government that they persuaded the crowned heads of Europe and the heads of church to ignore the warnings by telling them that it was part of a huge hoax and if they took any notice of it, they would be brought into ridicule. When this plot was discovered, the Bavarian government closed the lodges of the Grand Orient, outlawed 
Professor Weishaupt and disbanded the Illuminati. And with the devilish cunning with which they are inspired, Weishaupt pretended that the plot had come to an end and that he had become reconciled with God. But the word God can apply equally to Lucifer as it does to the supreme being that we worship. And that is why people are continually being deceived by the double talk of these people. Now, when the pressure had been put on the Illuminati in Europe, Thomas Jefferson, who was one of Weishaupt's great admirers, transferred the direction of the plot from Europe to America. I know that that's hard to take, but remember, we cannot judge Jefferson or any of those with whom he became associated. He may honestly have believed that only a one world government would bring an end to continuing wars and revolutions. Or he may, and only he and his maker know it, have become a member of the order and sect of the Illuminati. It would appear that the latter is what happened. As 1789, Professor Robinson, whom I referred to before, published a book entitled Truth of a conspiracy to destroy all governments and religions. And in that book, and there are copies of the book right here in the United States at the present time, carefully guarded. This book has recently been reprinted and is included in the book list on the back of this record. John Robinson, who was himself a high degree Mason, considered it was his duty to expose the Illuminati and their secret intentions, and he risked his life to publish that documentary. So in 1789, he gave warning that the Illuminati had infiltrated into Masonic lodges in the United States and had created a secret society within a secret society. Now, let it be clearly understood that I am not making any charges whatsoever against the Masonic orders of the Scottish or the Blue Rites or anybody else, because I know only too well that it is a rare occasion if even a 32nd or 33rd degree Mason suspects that higher than that is this secret power that infiltrated into their organization. Now, to give you some additional proof to show how these conspirators work, on July the 19th, 1798, David A. Tappan, president of Harvard University, warned the graduating class regarding the influence Illuminism was having in American politics and religion. Thanksgiving Day of the next year, 1789, Jediak Morse preached against Illuminism. He warned his congregation and the people of the United States that the Illuminists cover their true purpose by infiltrating into Masonic lodges and hiding their subversive acts and intentions under the cloak of philanthropy. In 1799, John Collins Ogden exposed the fact that Illuminists in New England were indefatigably engaged in destroying religion and government in America under deemed regard for their safety. In 1800, John Quincy Adams opposed Jefferson to the presidency of the United States. Adams had organized the New England Masonic Lodges. He wrote three letters to Colonel William L. Stone exposing Jefferson's subversive activities. The letters referred to are, or were, on exhibition in the Rittenhouse Square Library of Philadelphia only a few months ago. They are credited with having enabled John Quincy Adams winning the presidency. 
In 1826, Captain William Morgan took it upon himself to inform all other nations how and why the Illuminati were using their lodges for subversive purposes. The Illuminati delegated one of their members, Richard Howard, to execute Morgan as a traitor. Morgan tried to escape to Canada, but was captured at the border and murdered. Richard Howard reports to a meeting of the Knights Templars in St. John's Hall, New York, how he had executed Morgan. Arrangements, according to Elaine, were then made to ship Howard back to Liverpool in England, and the incident caused such indignation on the part of the Masonic fraternity that their records prove that as a result of this incident, thousands of Masons seceded from the northern jurisdiction. Since I published that in last issue's News Behind the News, the grandson of one of the men that led that revolt in some way got hold of a copy and he went to the trouble of sending me copies of the minutes that his grandfather had taken his great-grandfather had taken at the meetings that dealt with that very subject so that I would have additional evidence of the proof of what I'm telling you. In 1829, I just tell you these things because it shows how this conspiracy moves year by year and right up to the present day. In 1829, an English illuminist named Fanny Wright. You might wonder the person of the female sex being mixed up in this thing, but... The Grand Orient Lodges and the Lodge of the Councils of the New and Reformed Palladium Rites organize what they call Councils of Adoption. That is the female organization that work hand in glove with the Illuminati. This woman lectured to selected groups of Illuminists in the new Masonic Temple which had been built in New York. She explained the Luciferian ideology regarding free love and sexual liberty she also informed the American Illuminists it was intended to organize atheistic communism for the purpose of furthering their own secret plans and ambitions. Among those who were delegated to put this phase of the conspiracy into effect was Clinton Roosevelt, Horace Greeley, and Charles Dada. Nobody had ever heard the word communism used generally at that date. As a matter of fact, the word communism was not put into common use until after Lenin and Trotsky usurped power in 17 from the Mensheviks who had fought the Russian Revolution. It was only then that the word communism became into common use. I want you to mark these things very carefully. In 1841, Clinton Roosevelt published a book called The Science of Government Founded in Natural Law. That book embodies Weissop's pattern of a one-world UN-type dictatorship. Clinton Roosevelt was a direct ancestor of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt, Greeley, and Dad organized the local folk party in 1834 to cover the real purpose. They organized the first labor movement in the United States the following year and then covered their activities under the name of the Whig Party. And the money that they raised by these activities was used to finance none other than Karl Marx to write the Communist Manifesto and that's capital in Seoul, London, England. Karl Marx was the nephew of a Jewish rabbi, but he defected from Judaism. He was baptized into the Christian religion, and he was a hater of the Jews. He was no more an atheist than what I am. But he wrote that document so that he could get people who had lost their faith to join the Communist Party and allow themselves to be used to further the secret plans of the Illuminati. While Karl Marx and Engels were writing the Communist Manifesto, a German professor of the name of Karl Ritter of Frankfurt University 
was actually employed by the Illuminists writing the antithesis of the communist ideology so that the communist party and the anti-communist party could be used to divide the world's population into opposing camps and bring about World War I. Professor Karl Reiter was succeeded after his death by Nietzsche, who completed his work. As early as 1776, Russia had been designated as the empire which was to be destroyed and turned into the stronghold of atheistic communists. But the historians that teach in your universities and in your colleges don't say anything about that. What I'm telling you are historical facts. I'm not giving you my own opinions. They can be checked in your national archives in the British Museum of London, England, and in the Vatican libraries, and have been checked. When Giuseppe Mazzini was brought in contact with Pike, the two worked on this military plan to divide the countries of the world into opposing camps. And World War I was to be used to enable them to overthrow the powers of the Tsar and turn Russia into the stronghold of atheistic communism. In 1887, Pike and Lemmy, who had succeeded Mazzini as the director of the World Revolutionary Movement, Lenin succeeded Lemmy, decided that political Zionism was to be organized by Herzl and then used for two purposes. First of all, to create the state of Israel, and secondly, to enable the Illuminati to prevent World War III using the differences between the Israeli and the Arab Mohammedans to serve that purpose. The plot also required that after World War I had turned Russia into the stronghold of atheistic communism, Communism was to be built up in strength by the leaders of our so-called democratic countries until it equaled in strength in every respect the united Christian world, and then it was to be contained. And it was to be contained until the last. Everybody considers that communism is a movement by the laboring classes to destroy capital. Nothing could be more ridiculous. The Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks were used to permit and fight the revolution in Russia in 1905 and 1916, but all the time hovering in the background were these Illuminists who had chosen Lenin and Trotsky to lead the movement to usurp the powers of government in Russia just as soon as the moment was ripe. Now, in 1916, the international bankers of Britain, the United States, Germany, Sweden, and France met in Stockholm for the purpose of deciding the final details of the Russian Revolution, and they were joined by Henry Ford. Henry Ford, who originally wrote a series of books exposing the Illuminati conspiracy, was himself duped into going along with them. The Ford Foundation has since carried out many of the stated goals of the conspirators under the beneficent hand of Henry Ford II, whose father never dreamed that his own fortune would be used to advance the cause of his worst enemy. Who went over under the, gave the world the impression that he sailed in that famous peace ship. Well, of course, there's different kinds of peace. We know that the communists today are talking peace, but that they mean 
the peace that will be had when all other opposing forces have been destroyed. The average communist doesn't know that he also is to be destroyed in the final phase of the conspiracy. And it was by making these facts known to the leaders of the Communist Party in Canada that we split the Communist Party right down the middle in 1957. We supplied them with copies of a letter that Albert Pike had written to Mazzini on August the 15th, 1871, the year before Mazzini died. And that exposed the whole diabolical aspect of the, that aspect of the conspiracy. Lenin and Trotsky were not atheists. Lenin had been initiated into the order and sect of the Illuminati in Switzerland, where Trotsky was initiated, I am not familiar. But this will shock you. British intelligence knew exactly what was being planned, and so did your American intelligence officers, because they reported all the details of this secret meeting in Stockholm to their governments, just the same as I reported that secret meeting that happened on St. Simon's Island, February the 14th this last year. No notice was taken. The powers behind the scenes of government are too strong to even allow your government, which you so proudly say is of the people, for the people, by the people. And ours is just the same. But the fact remains that they deposited $50 million to the credit of Trotsky in the Bank of Sweden. And while that was being done, Lenin was being given safe conduct from Switzerland to Russia with 38 top-level revolutionary readers in a private car supplied by the high command of the German government. And that movement from Switzerland to Germany, if Lenin and his party was organized by the brother of Paul Warburg, who drafted your Federal Reserve legislation in 1910 and had it put into effect in 1913. His brother was chief of the German intelligence staff and negotiated the transfer of Lenin and these top ranking aluminous into Russia. Now, Trotsky was building up his group of revolutionary leaders on the east side of New York, and when he sailed from New York to Sweden, the British Navy intercepted the vessel and took Trotsky and his fellow revolutionary leaders off the vessel, landed them at Halifax and confined them in the emigration sheds and put them under the guard of the Northwest Mountain Police, as they were known in that day. But that didn't suit those that are directing the world revolutionary movement. Mackenzie King, William Lyon Mackenzie King, who had been educated and trained as a member of the Illuminati because his father had been a revolutionary leader in Canada, a brilliant, cold-blooded, professional politician became Minister of Labor in Canada in 1907. He was doing the work of the international conspirators as far back as that day. When World War I broke out, or was about to break out, Mackenzie King retired from the Canadian government and took the position as head of the Rockefeller Department of Public Relations. Now, when we had captured Trotsky and his fellow conspirators, and they had been placed in detention in Halifax, Mackenzie King was sent by the Rocky Fellows to Ottawa, and he issued the ultimatum that unless those men were not only released but given safe conduct to Sweden, the United States would cut off all financial and other aid to Britain and France. President Woodrow Wilson.
who said time and time again, I will not let our boys die on foreign soil, was a stooge of Colonel Edward Mandel House, an errand boy for the hierarchy of the Illuminati in America, the Rockefellers, Bernard Baruch, Jacob Schiff, etc. Wilson wired the British government demanding that Trotsky and his men be released or the United States would not enter World War I as agreed upon. So, to prevent defeat, we took the lesser of two evils, and Trotsky was put on board another ship, and we had the humility of escorting that man to the entrance of the Baltic Sea. These are the things that of international intrigue that's going on all the time, and you're not allowed to know a thing about it. As soon as the war was over, as you, well, I'm not going to go into all the details of the Russian Revolution, but you know that Trotsky and Lenin did take over the powers of government in Russia. Now, the normal people talk about 98% of those men that went with Lenin and Trotsky into Russia to usurp the powers of government being used. That's a perfectly correct statement if we use the word Jew as it is generally used. But remember this, they entered Russia in the August and September of 1916. When Lenin died in 1924, there was not a single member of the first international of the Communist Party left alive or out of exile except one or two who were initiated as members of the Illuminati. All the others, after they served their purpose, were liquidated, as happens to everybody that serves the Illuminati, whether they know it or not. As soon as they have served their purpose, they're wiped out with as little compunction as you and I would swat a fly. Now, the madness as had been founded by Professor Carl Witter the same year, 1848, that Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, had to be used to foment World War II for the purpose of destroying the German Empire and reducing the strength of the British Empire so it was no longer a world power. And we all know that that is exactly what happened. But according to the Pike Plan and this re overall revolutionary blueprint, it also had to be used so that the political Zionist party would be given a sovereign state in Palestine where the differences between political Zionism and the Arabs would, would and could be used to foment World War III. The Treaty of Marseille was deliberately written in such a manner that it facilitated those who were directing the world revolutionary movement of starting World War II when they thought the time was right. You'll find all kinds of documentation in there, secret messages passing between the heads of your government and ours. And let me tell you this, some friends of mine high-ranking British officers and some of your own countrymen did everything within their powers to try and prevent World War II breaking out. They knew the details of this conspiracy as I'm explaining it to you. They went to Prime Minister Chamberlain and they told him that if he allowed World War II to break out into a hot and shooting war, that it would be continued until Britain had been destroyed as a world power. They even convinced Chamberlain of the truth of their statements. And that is why he went to Munich and came back with his umbrella and a piece of paper saying peace in our time. But then Chamberlain was maneuvered into a position where he had to declare war to keep the promise to the Polish people over the Karler incident. But you know that the first months of that war 
we've referred to as a phony war. Chamberlain and the Premier of France had agreed that they would not bomb any German targets other than strictly military targets. That didn't suit these bloodthirsty international gangsters. That was too slow. So they gave orders that Chamberlain had to be got rid of, and Chamberlain didn't know what to do. He told Commander Ramsey, a very highly decorated officer in army intelligence, and a man who was a member of parliament for people's share in Scotland, he said, if you will only get me definite evidence of what is going on behind the scenes, he said, I will put a stop to this war. Ramsey approached a man in the American embassy. And he told him, if you will only give me copies of the secret correspondence and signals that was passing between Churchill and Roosevelt, and let me have them just long enough to show the Prime Minister, he says, we we'll end this war. And that clerk, that cipher clerk, did as requested in the hope that by so doing he could prevent World War II being developed into the Holocaust that it was. That man was Tyler Kent. That sealed not only Chamberlain's fate, but it sealed the fate of all those patriots who were working in close cooperation with Captain Ramsey. And the powers behind the government insisted that there be an election. Churchill was elected prime minister. On February 8, 1920, Sir Winston Churchill, before his forced acceptance in the Illuminati, wrote an article that was carried in the Illustrated Sunday Herald. From the days of Spartacus, Weissopt to those of Karl Marx, he wrote, to those of Trotsky, Russia, Bela Kuhn, Hungary, Rosa Luxemburg, Germany, and Emma Goldman, the United States, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development of envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing. It played a definitely recognizable role in the tragedy of the French Revolution. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century. And now at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become practically the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. The 12 o'clock of the day, that May the 12th, that he was elected prime minister, he gave the Royal Air Force orders that they was to bomb open towns and cities in Germany that night. At midnight, he broke the previous prime minister's promise with the French president that would not do that. At midnight on that same day, he had the secret police that nobody knew were even in existence in England. Raid the homes of about 400 and some odd patriots, including admirals of the British Navy, and they took them and their wives out of their beds in the middle of the night and locked them up in Brixton prison without a charge or opportunity for trial, and they kept them there for four and a half years. I'm not telling you a fairy tale. I'm quoting historical facts. The people of England have never been allowed to know that yet, and yet I have admirals of Barry Donnell, with whom I am in constant correspondence, and I served with his brother in the First World War on the same ship, and I know every detail of everything that happened about that. Admiral Donnell was one of the finest and most capable British admirals that our country produced. He was the greatest fighting admiral that we had 
in the First World War. He fought and won more engagements in and around the Bight of Heligoland than any other British admiral. He was four times decorated by the king with the highest honors that could be conferred on him, and after the war, he was put in charge of all naval establishments and then made director of naval intelligence. Admiral Donald told me that he was 58 years of age before he began to suspect that the secret power that seemed to be able to cause our governments to adopt policies that led to their own destruction was the Illuminati. After World War II had served its purpose, and Nazism had been used to serve the purpose of the Illuminati, those who had directed the war on the German side were ordered liquidated. But so that it would be made look legal and nice, we had the Nuremberg trials where they were legally murdered. Now, anybody that served in a high ranking position in your Navy, the Canadian Navy, or the British Navy, know that we have to obey orders. And those orders are given by the politicians, the civilians. Admiral Bacon, one of our British admirals, had the courage to write to Mr. Churchill in the First World War and said, Sir, fighting the enemy is a pleasure. Fighting your you politicians is the damnedest headache a man could inflict on himself. That was what Admiral Bacon, who was one of these gruff old fellows, and he didn't give a continental cuss for all the politicians this side of hated. And he wrote that to Mr. Churchill. Now, as a result of the Second World War, the United Nations was formed. Just one more step towards a one world government. Your government gave recognition to Soviet Russia and was quickly followed by Britain. If you remember, the Bolsheviks became so powerful due to the aid we had given them that we had to fight a war of containment in 1919, 1920, and 1921. The conditions under which we fought the Bolsheviks was exactly the same as the conditions your troops and ours fought in Korea this last war. We were never allowed to give them a darn good licking as soon as we had just pushed them back and got them into where they couldn't, where they were contained, then we had to stop. We weren't allowed to deliver the knockout blow. Good Lord, Bolshevism, or as we know it today, international communism could have been absolutely wiped out in Russia between 1919 and 1921. But that wasn't in accordance with Weishaupt's or Pike's plan. That plan said it had to be built up until it equaled in strength the whole of United Christendom. Now, is there any person in this audience can deny that during World War II, international communism was not built up until it equaled in strength the whole of United Christendom? What about Yalta, Tehran, Boston? Stalin took all they offered and asked for more. And because it suited the purpose of those directing international entry at the top, he got all he asked for. And those that were working with him, the three big men, thought Stalin was playing along with him. I think history will prove that Stalin went so far as to agree that FDR would be the first king despot. And when he double-crossed FDR after Yalta, that was the end of FDR. You want to ask some of your own intelligence officers if they open up. Thank God I never took the oath. I've been working at intelligence work since way back in 1912. 
And on every occasion that I was brought into the intelligence department, I begged on taking the oath, and because there was no difference of opinion between my senior officers, Admiral S.S. Jones and these other admirals I've mentioned, they never required me to take the oath, and that's the only thing that let my tongue loose so I could speak. If you belong to intelligence, to the FBI, or the Royal Mount Mountain Police, you are not allowed to divulge. I never asked them for any information. Working with a small, tight-knit group, we gave them all the information that came into our hands. But I was so close to intelligence, that is, the director of intelligence, that I had my own office in the intelligence department at Ottawa, and I had one sonographer delegated to do all my typing, and my wife and I are godfather and godmother to one officer who was director of naval intelligence for a period of five years, and another man who is our highest ranking intelligence officer, he and his wife are godfather and godmother to one might, so we've been pretty close to this dim. I've had the pleasure of being the guest in the homes of nearly all these men I'm talking, and I've had the opportunity of discussing different angles. They are not in the habit of volunteering information, but if you ask them a direct question, all you have to do is to look into their eyes. As I told the head commissioner of the Mountain Police when we were having a conference one day, he says, you know I can't talk. No, but I says, you're a darn poor poker player, because after I ask you a question, all I have to do is to look in your eyes, and I can see the answer just glaring at me. <laughs> well, the progress towards the one world government had to be quickened, so the League of Nations was transferred to the United Nations. Now, going back to where I began my story and told you that this World Revolutionary Movement started in the celestial world when Lucifer challenged the right to Almighty God to be the supreme authority on the grounds that his plan for the rule of the universe was weak and impractical because it was based on the premise that lesser beings could be taught to know him, love him, and serve him out of respect for his infinite perfections. I told you that the Luciferian plan was to ensure peace and law and order by the enforcement of a totalitarian dictatorship enforced by absolute despotism. That theory is what is being put into force here today. The people that we're so proud to say govern the country are not going to have any say unless we educate them and make them understand that we are in the semi-final stage of this condition. Now you say it's too late, because we have the words of our Lord Jesus Christ who told us that if we would go out and teach all nations the truth and the whole truth, knowledge of the truth would set us free from the bonds with which we are being bound by the Luciferian conspirators. This isn't a racial or religious or a political matter. Because in the final analysis, the satanic forces will divide those that survive the final social upheaval into just two classes. The brilliant-minded ones that have plotted and planned all this will be the rulers, and all the rest will be those that they enslave. It's an extraordinary thing, but the more you study all angles of this conspiracy, you find out that the brilliant-minded international gangsters that think out all the details of the various aspects of this conspiracy are financed by being awarded Nobel Prizes. Alfred Nobel was the inventor of dynamite that has killed more people in wartime than any other weapon ever invented. The Nobel Peace Prize 
has been won by such men as Linus Pauling and Martin Luther King. And the Peace Prize is an instrument used by the conspirators to carry on their work. Our Reverend Mr. What's his name? Uh, Methodist minister. He was given forty-five thousand dollars to work inside the religious thing. Not long ago, Bertrand Russell was awarded the Nobel Prize for his book, The Impact of Science on Society. I know Rod Chisholm personally. He was the Minister of Health for Canada before he was appointed as Canada's de chief delegate to the United Nations. He hadn't been very long in the United Nations when he was made president of the World Health Organization, which you know of by the three letters WHO, W-H-O. After he had put the internationalist brains, put their ideas into actual practice within the World Health Organization, he then was made director and president of the United Nations Mental Health Organization. Rob Chisholm says there's only one way to use the human capital. He says reduce the whole lot to one common denominator. Interbreed them, mix them up, get one great big mass of mongrelized humanity, and then put them under the yoke of absolute slavery, and he says you won't have any more wars through evolution. Well, that sounds logic. If the ruling class that consider they know that an almighty God how to rule the universe get away with what they're working at, all the rest will be classified as goyim. And the word G-O-Y-I-M does not mean gender. It means human cattle. That is the definition of that word. This play of words is confusing everybody. The whole diabolical plan is dependent on the agents of the Illuminati causing bigotry, hatred on religious, political, economic, any other major issue, so that they can get us divided and throw us at each other's throats. Now, I have mentioned that when this conspiracy has developed to the final stage, that is after World War III, that the greatest social capitalism that the world has ever known is to be provoked by the Illuminati. Before I read you Pike's letter of instruction to Mazzini, telling him exactly how this final phase was to be put into operation, I just want to mention that World War III was scheduled to start Christmas week, 1957. I had called that shot years and years. You'll find it in the books that were published years ago, so I just couldn't think it up out of my head tonight. I said that if we permitted World War III, to be developed as intended, the year 1960 would be the year of no return. You'll find those statements in my book. I have no reason to withdraw them or even to qualify. I watched what was going on in certain areas of this world, and where I couldn't observe the things personally, friends of mine helped. Weishaupt and Pike had both said that those brilliant-minded international gangsters that were determined to enslave the lesser beings were to provide for their own safety and protection by establishing sanctuaries before each of the succeeding wars broke out. And that pattern has been maintained ever since the French Revolution, which broke out in 1789. 
in no revolution, be it the French revolutions, and there's been several of them, the Spanish revolutions, the German revolutions, the British revolutions, your American revolutions, the Austrian or any other revolution, have any of the members of the Illuminati or their families been harmed, nor has their properties. They were always safely hidden away in sanctuaries. That is why Switzerland was the biggest sanctuary of the lot. It was made a mutual country, so those directing both sides of the wars could meet and discuss how they would continue them or bring them to an end. With the advent of the atomic bomb, they just didn't know what to do, because before they could let the masses use atomic weapons and nerve gas to destroy themselves in still greater numbers, they had to know what part of the Earth's surface was safe for their own miserable hides. They couldn't afford to get contaminated with atomic fallout, or to be burnt with nerve gas, which means dead. So what did they do? After the two bombs were exploded on, on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, they started the series of appearing explosions all over the world. Britain, Soviet Russia, Australia, the United States, whose governments are all controlled at the top by these devils in human form. They popped off a bomb here, they popped off a bomb there, and they had their nuclear scientists all over the world measuring the atomic fallout so that they could find, if possible, places in which they could be perfectly safe while we were cutting each other's throats from year to year. It is not generally known, but Germany could have won World War II hands down. But they were not allowed. These Illuminati, who were behind the government of Germany, had strict instructions that the German Empire and the Nazi Party were to be destroyed. And I defy any member of the American High Command to deny this statement. The German army had sufficient nerve gas stockpiled two years before the war ended to have wiped out the whole population of Britain, France, and the United States had they been allowed to use it. Now, nerve gas is the most lethal weapon. The satanic inspiration has enabled the mind of man to discover this. It is nothing more or less than the pure essence of fluorine gas. And it is so deadly and so devilish in its characteristics that if one single drop, even though it be highly diluted, comes in contact with the flesh of any living creature, it will travel along the nerve trunks and paralyze the breathing apparatus and thus cause death. There is only one antidote to that, and that is atropine. But atropine would have to be injected immediately the first strangling sensation was experienced, and you would have to keep injecting it until you could get out of the contaminated area and get further medical. The members of the armed forces of your country and mine are being equipped with atropine outfits. But what about the civilian population? Now one of the devilish features of nerve gas is this. You can wipe out the population of Chicago or New York or any big Canadian city and not do one single dollar's worth of property damage. Now, all this nonsense about the fear of atomic bombs is just getting the masses into a state of fear that they'll go off half cock and agree that it's essential to contain Russia or something else to have another world war. These men 
that have the wealth and the power in their hands and secretly administer that power behind the scenes of government are not going to destroy billions and billions of dollars worth of property when they can take over by using a few dollars worth of fluorine gas. They call it nerve gas because they figured it would interfere with their idea to promote fluoridation if the public got to know that nerve gas is nothing but the pure essence of fluorine gas and gaseous form. After studying the weather conditions that had prevailed over 50 years and studying the atomic fallout and the deposits, nerve gas deteriorates very quick. 48 hours it loses its uh, deadly characteristics and an invading army could move into a place that had been prayed in 48 hours. But there is a residue which collects in the clouds and is brought to earth the same as what the atomic fallout is by precipitation rain. Now, in 1955, the year that I was starting to publish these two books, the scientists had reached the conclusion that one part of the world that was safe was that area bounded by southern Florida, the islands of the Caribbean Sea, and the British West Indies. As soon as that was secretly known, all the big multi-multi-millionaires started the most intense building operations this country has ever known. The chairman of the Aluminum Company of America, Mr. Davis, bought 10,000 acres on the Isle of Pines and proceeded to turn it into one of the most luxurious hideaways where he and his top level members of the Illuminati could live in peace and luxury while we were wiping each other off the face of the earth. Britain was so concerned about the increase of population in the West Indies that they financed the movement of around 250,000 West Indians out of the island and moved them into England and Canada, paid their furs, told them it was to improve their conditions. Now, A.P. Taylor, who owns and controls the brewery interests of Canada, Hoffman, Bronfman, who controls all the stillers in Canada, and who are no more Jews are Zionists than what I am, but they control the movement at the top. And a group of their international gangsters that control the Canadian government's policy just as another group controls yours, they formed the syndicate. The first ante was $15 million, and they started to build palatial resorts throughout the West Indies and other islands of the Caribbean Sea. A bunch of your Chicago financiers and others extended Miami right down until it reaches now to Key West. All that happened after that's been called the safe earth. It's a good job my nurse, when I was a kid, dropped me on my head because she developed such a thump of curiosity that I've never recovered it from it yet. And knowing what was in the wind, I had to go down there and see for myself what was going on. That is what took me down to Florida in the February of 1957. And what did we find? They were organizing water transports between the islands. They were taking cargo ship loads of preserved and tinned foods and stockpiling them throughout the area. They were building great big water condensers so that in case of drought or lack of precipitation they can have the sea water turned into drinking water. Vining Davis was at the back of that 
reclamation program in which thousands and thousands of acres of marshland in Florida was drained and cultivated and tilled so it became fertile ground for growing what you call market vegetables, small fruits and vegetables. 200,000 head of cattle were transferred from Texas into the ranches of Florida so they would be sure of a meat supply. With that amount of cattle breeding and the fish that were available in the ocean, in the coastal waters, they were quite satisfied that with their ability to grow their own fruit and vegetables, raise their own meat, catch their own fish, that added to the tremendous amount of, of staples that flour and other things that have been shipped into that area by ocean-going garden vessel would make them absolutely self-contained. Now, because these men always like to make a project pay for itself, they rented all this luxurious accommodation that was built in 55, 56 to tourists. And they were quite willing to take them for all they had got, make them pay through the nose for this luxurious living, and they were quite welcome to pay the shot until they wanted to move down in there. And they had it all planned how they get rid of them so that they could occupy the vacated accommodation. They call the general strike of hotel employees. And all the people in those luxurious resorts couldn't get any kind of service. So the people that owned them were very apologetic and they flew them all out. And as soon as they got rid of them, every plane leaving these northern airports were chartered to fly the big boys down in to take over the accommodation that had been vacated. By heavens, we had some of my friends keep a record of who were chartering the planes and the people that were going on, just the same as we checked those that were landing at, at uh, Georgia Airport for the St. Simon Island meeting. And amongst the people that had their own planes chartered to take them down south just before Christmas was the head of your international unions that had done all the negotiation to amalgamate the unions at the top. Not only the American, but the Canadian. They both had private planes for the whole bunch of the top fellows who had been serving the international. And the labor let them get away with it. Goodness gracious me, I don't know how stupid people can get. It's so obvious. And then, when the whole thing was ready, and somebody was going to press the button, the Lord entered into the picture and took a stand. And you never saw the like of it in all your born days. I've traveled all over the world and I never saw anything like it. All of a sudden, just toward the end of November, the earliest and most severe frost that had struck Florida in 50 years hit and the papyrus trees just wilted. They brushed out, covered them with blankets, covered them with honey. Didn't do any good. They were flat on the ground. The next day, every blessed one was wiped out. The fruit and vegetables that were just getting to maturity for the Christmas market were wiped out completely. There wasn't a, an, an onion or a radish or a lettuce left. And the rain started to fall, and the wind started to blow from every direction other than was expected. And there was such complete chaos as far as weather conditions were concerned that they fired the poor old metriologist at Tamper because he couldn't call the shots 12 hours in advance. So they fired him, and they brought the top fellow down from Washington. And when he got down there, all he did was hold his head, and he couldn't predict what the weather was going to be for 24 hours. 
So they have to call the war up to men. Oh, we were just saying. They called the war up. They only postponed it for a while. They thought that these weather conditions couldn't prevail much longer. And you know there was such a precipitation of rain that the fallout in Florida and for nuclear fallout and chlorine was such that 76,000 head of cattle died. 76,000 head of cattle died. The next thing that happened, Christmas week came. You never saw such beautiful weather in your life. Everybody was down on the beach just swimming and bathing. For seven days we had perfect weather. Then the angels put pulled out the plug again and the water came down and the wind started to blow and the temperature was all around. I was fortunate. I was so convinced that something like this would happen. I had a great big hand-knitted woolen coat and you know I've been stopped a dozen times on the street by people who said, I'll give you 40 bucks for that coat. Everybody thought it was nuts when I went down there with a great big hand-knitted coat. But boys, I was comfortable when other people were freezing to death. And then the second frost wiped out the next crop just as it was ready for market. And the cattle started to starve to death. There wasn't enough grass left on the pasture land. And before they could organize an emergency feeding program, they had to pull the grapefruit crop and take those great big wagons that carry about 10 tons and dump them in the pastures. And the cattle were so hungry, they just munched grapefruit to keep alive. And that is a truth, and there's thousands of people can support that statement. Then, the most mysterious thing of the whole episode happened. The fish that were so abundant in the coastal waters, in the islands, and around the coast, they disappeared to the Lord knows where, and he won't tell. You couldn't catch enough fish in a couple of hours to supply five or six families, and when the fishing boats would go out and bring great big cargoes of lovely fish in, they couldn't find the fish. They even put electronic devices in their boats and went out 300 miles to sea to try and locate the fish shoals. No good. Forty percent of those that own commercial fishing boats and charter boats went bankrupt and the financiers took over their votes. Forty percent. Then, just to make sure that there wouldn't be any nonsense, in the beginning of 1958, as the third crop was ready for the market, the Lord sent another frost and wiped that. It was the latest frost that's ever been recorded. So we poor suckers that were down there getting the information found ourselves paying 35 cents a head for lettuce and 29 for piece for cucumbers and so on all the way down the line. They even had to fly it. the food that we people needed there from California and Mexico and all that's what happened down in Florida. But the scientist said that the blurry that fell down was brought down out of the clouds by the rain and that it is accumulated from the smoke from chemical factories. That the smoke had gone up and lodged in the clouds and these unprecedented downpours of rain had released it and dropped it on the grass and the pasture. Well, I don't believe that because I know that they were frantically taking tests of Spanish moths and every other thing. I had doctors that I could rely on, and they were watching all these tests, and they just did not know what was to happen. The United Nations was taking up the matter of stopping a further atomic test because of this atomic fallout. That is what's going on in this world. No. We started to show that the conditions which we experience today started in the supernatural world are conducted by men who are inspired by the 
satanic forces. Their purpose is to prevent us putting God's plan into operation so his will can be done here in heaven and what have you today in the United Nations. God has been kicked out of politics and the name of God is rarely used except as blasphemy or oath on the lips of foul-mouthed people. But the scriptures tell us that God is a jealous God. And I'm quite sad that he has taken measure of the satanic forces that work in this world and the feverish haste with which they are trying to bring their devilish plan into its final stage shows that they think time is running out. Now, it's all very well saying, well, don't worry, God will look after us. God has a habit of helping those who help themselves. He told us that if we were hearers of the word and not doers of the word, it was available as nothing. If the truth has been made known to us, it is our duty to pass that truth on to as many other human beings as possible. Because whether or not we can halt this devilish conspiracy before God has to intervene to save all flesh being destroyed or not, by making the truth known to our neighbors, we can at least open their eyes and make them realize what is going on so that they too can become the elect of Almighty God. That is the duty. We will not be judged according to the results that we achieve. We will be judged according to the amount of effort we put into serving his holy will during the term of our life on this earth. There, ladies and gentlemen, you have a picture. Now, I just want to read this in conclusion. Albert Pike, on August the 15th, 1871, wrote a letter of instruction to Mazzini, telling him what I have told you, and his concluding paragraph reads as follows. We, the Illuminati, shall unleash the nihilist and atheist, and we shall provoke a formidable social catalysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and the most bloody term. Then everywhere, the citizens are obliged to defend themselves against the world minority or revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity which will be from that moment without compass and direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out in the public view, a manifestation which will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. The word God is used by these Luciferians just the same as we use the word God. On July the 14th, 1889, Pike had to correct the beliefs of some of his leaders in the new Palladian life who were Satan worshippers. So he wrote this letter of instruction. That which we must say to the masses of the crowd is we worship God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. The Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. 
Now, I want to repeat. Nations up to the 32nd and 33rd degree do not know about the details of this plot until recently, and therefore they cannot be blamed. In the original writing of the Order and Sect of the Illuminati, there are nine paragraphs that deal with how Freemasonry and other secret societies are to be wiped out after the Illuminati have been established their leader king despot of the world. So they don't uh, play any favors. Everybody except their own little clique are to be either wiped out or subjugated. Lenin said it didn't matter. 75% of the world's population was liquidated as long as they controlled the other 25%. Referring to this God, what we say to the crowd is we worship God. But it is the gods that won the doors without superstition. I'll skip the next part. Uh, the Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adame, whose deeds prove his cruelty, avidity, and hatred of men, barbarism, and repulsion for science? Yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adami is God also. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods. Thus the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy. And the true and pure religion is belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adami, but Lucifer, God of light, God of good is struggling for humanity against Adani, the god of darkness and evil. Now, the word Adani is used to identify God by the Luciferian creed when it is being exemplified in the higher degrees of the Grand Orient Lodges and uh, those of the New and Reformed Palladian Rites. There is the picture. I maintain that if the public can be educated to know the truth, Public opinion can become such a force that it will become a greater power on this earth than any atomic weapon developed state. The only thing that those who, from their dark places and their secret hidings, fear is the truth. They fear the truth and only the truth. Some of their greatest leaders have said that if one man penetrates the secret and makes it known their plans could be set back 3,000 years or destroyed completely. All we have to do is carry out the mandate given to us by Almighty God. If we don't, we'll all, Americans, Canadians, British, and all those that call ourselves free, will find ourselves in the same pot being stirred up in a beautiful, delicious devil's brew. And those fiends will reduce us to one common mass of mongrelized humanity by the application on an international scale of artificial insemination. Bertram Russell, on page 49, 50 and 51, of his Nobel Prize winning book, The Impact of Science on Society, says that less than 30% of the females will be selected for breeding purposes and less than 5% of the males. And the breeding will be the same as on a stock farm. It will be strictly limited and selected to fill the requirements of the state. That's what they think that's what is at the back of this integration and all the rest of it. They completely cover and disguise their foul intentions by putting a whole lot of little targets up so that we point our rifles and sight on those little targets and blaze away. And they don't care how many thousand rounds of ammunition we shoot at the targets they stick up as long as they are safe behind the butts and we're not hurting them. And let's get wakened up. 
the heaven of faith we sacrificed nearly 30 million human lives in World War I and II, and the honest belief that we were fighting for our king and our country, or God and our country, and if we were willing to risk our lives on the battlefield, or on the seas, or in the air, surely the goodness, the courage of the early martyrs hasn't disappeared completely. What are we afraid of? 